which required a whole set of new techniques to fabricate. Hot presses to form and size the parts. Machine tools and drills to cut the new alloy. The nacelle rings that form the area that houses the engines were the largest titanium forgings ever attempted. These rings, formed with integral upset stubs, simplify wing and stabilizer attachment. Even the black paint necessary to withstand the blistering heat had to be developed. As Kelly Johnson has often said, just about everything on the Blackbird had to be invented, from rivets to hydraulic oil, window glass to fasteners. Lockheed's advanced development projects, working closely with its customer and suppliers, in all phases of development, manufacturing, and testing, was responsible for the success of this versatile airplane. On 26 April 1971, a crew from Beale Air Force Base flew the Blackbird to new and exceptional records for duration and total distance. Cruising at three times the speed of sound, the SR was flown over 15,000 miles the equivalent of a non-stop trip from San Francisco to Paris and return. The crew was awarded the McKay Trophy for 1971 for the most meritorious United States Air Force flight of the year. When it was decided to display the Blackbird at the Farnborough Air Show in England, it was a natural to break the speed record from New York to London. Preparation for the record speed dash from New York to London was routine for the mission planning branch. Because of the speed of the SR, precise mission planning is required, which puts unique demands on navigation. To meet these demands, a computer program was developed to integrate all of the aircraft's performance factors and flight characteristics. Route information is assembled and fed into the computer, where a navigation tape and aircrew route map is prepared. The tape is utilized in the highly accurate navigational system developed specifically for the Blackbird mission. A flight simulator designed by the Advanced Development Projects permits the nav tape to be flown and verified before the flight. So realistic is this simulator, it is used to check crew proficiency. Major Sullivan and Major Whittefield, regular SR crew members, were selected to make the flight. The space-like pressure suit is similar to those worn by the astronauts. It consists of an inner garment of pressure vessels and an outer protective suit with built-in attachment for chute harness, life support connections, a helmet, gloves, and boots. Developed for the role of the very high and very fast environment of the SR-71, the suit provides protection in the event of a decompression or bailout. The system contains a complete survival kit stowed in the seat cushion. August 31st, 1974. Beale Air Force Base on the Pacific coast of the United States. Boarding for the record-breaking flight from New York to London started before midnight. Flight across the United States, the Blackbird will refuel off the coast of North Carolina. Because the tanker aircraft cannot reach the speed or altitude of the SR, it is necessary to slow down and descend to refuel. The Blackbird is now in position to pass through the timing gate over New York City. Accelerating out to a speed over Mach 3 and near 80,000 feet, following a great circle route, allowed the SR to cruise in its designed element. During this time, the skin temperature will exceed 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Each air inlet, combined with the J-58 turbo bypass engine, will be converting the Mach 3 ram air pressure into thrust equivalent to the horsepower of the Queen Mary, 
as the aircraft travels faster than the speed of a bullet. The sealant, used to seal the fuel tanks, was a joint and continuing effort in development of fluorosilicone elastomers to withstand three-plus flight. After a routine crossing at better than Mach 3, the SR passes through the timing gate near London and makes a flyby over the Farnborough Air Show, revealing its double delta-shaped wing and pencil-like fuselage. Designed without flaps or spoilers, it lands at a speed less than a fighter aircraft, with only brakes and a drag chute. The welcoming committee greets the crew. The previous record from New York to London was four hours, 46 minutes, and has been shattered by the Blackbird. The SR-71's official time for the 3,470 statute mile trip was one hour, 55 minutes, 32 seconds. Many notables were present for this momentous occasion, including the SR's designer, Mr. C.L. Kelly Johnson. Spectators arrive for the official opening of Farnborough International Air Show 74. As the Blackbird is towed to its static display position, it passes several other current Lockheed family members. The Air Force's C-5A Galaxy, largest member of the Lockheed family. The P-3C Orion, land-based ASW aircraft, and the carrier-based S-3A Viking, sub-chaser, all stars in their own right. Each day the air show is opened with a flyby of the Anglo-French Concorde supersonic transport. The flying display of commercial and military aircraft from many nations thrilled the crowds of spectators. Helicopters demonstrate versatility with speed and maneuverability. Sailplanes execute graceful and silent maneuvers above the airfield. The Rothman International Aerobatic Team in their bi-wing pit specials awed the crowds. The Swedish Biggins, in tight formation, truly lived up to their name, which translated means Thunderbolt. A World War II Lancaster bomber adds a little nostalgia. The British Harrier fighters demonstrate the latest in vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. PSA's Lockheed L-1011 with Rolls-Royce engines presents the finest in wide-body technology. After a week-long program thrilling the air show crowds, the United States Air Force F-15 Eagle goes through its final performance and touches down behind the SR-71 display area. Members of the SR's record-breaking team answered questions and autographed fact sheets for the thousands of visitors to the Blackbird static display. With the British Red Arrow aerobatic team bringing the Farnborough Air Show to a close, the decision to return non-stop to Beale Air Force Base by way of Los Angeles was announced. No record existed for this flight, although the airlines fly it regularly in 12 to 14 hours. The SR was flown to Mildenhall Air Base, a short distance from Farnborough, in preparation for the flight. A second flight crew, Captain Adams and Major McCorrick, were on hand to make the return flight. Suit-up of the crew by the Physiological Support Division was routine. Preparation for the flight progressed on schedule. Having been briefed on the mission and the weather en route, the pilot and RSO board for the flight to California.
Following a spectacular takeoff, the aircraft made a perfect pass through the London Gate and headed west across the Atlantic and Greenland, slowing down to refuel over the Hudson Bay in Canada. The SR headed for Los Angeles. Decelerating and descending, the arrival was announced over the Los Angeles timing gate by the slight rumble of a sonic boom. A turn north brings the Blackbird home. Landing at Beale Air Force Base, the announcement was made. The setting of still another record for the Blackbird family. London to Los Angeles. A distance of 5,463 statute miles in three hours, 47 minutes, and 39 seconds. On hand to greet the crew was General Pitts, commander of the 15th Air Force, and Mr. Russ Daniel, Lockheed Vice President and SR-71 General Manager. The press and TV networks documented the event. The SR-71, designed a decade ago, with thousands of hours above Mach 3 to its credit, flying reconnaissance missions in the defense of the United States. The Blackbird has set a new record from New York to London and established a record, London to Los Angeles. A tradition for the Blackbird family, the record breakers. Hi, I'm Captain Wilson at Davis Mothin Air Force Base, and I'm just getting suited up for a U-2 high flight. training program for U-2 student pilots. Instead of attending a formalized training school, students are sent to the 349th Strategic Reconnaissance Squadron at davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona. Here they're trained by pilots of the operational squadron itself. Basically, it's an airplane like any other airplane once you get it off the ground and flying around at altitude and everything. But when you come within a few feet of the ground, it's just really a bucket of worms. It just goes all over the place. It's probably the squirreliest airplane I've ever flown before in my life. You can't land it on speed because of the way the center of gravity is. Because if you hit on the main gear first, it'll just bounce up into the air. So uh, you have to land it in a complete stall and preferably about one foot off the ground. There's 10 feet. Five, four, four feet. Landing one of these aircraft is pretty much a two-headed snake. One of the problems is we have great big wings and a bicycle landing gear, and that makes it hard to land. Reset your trim. We've got to depend on our mobile vehicles here to uh, get us in a position where we can actually watch the aircraft throughout the landing and uh, takeoff roll. And once we clear the runway, we've got to get back into a position for a second touch and go or for another landing. Our mobile runway is clear. Now we'll be pulling right out behind him here, and you'll be able to see just exactly what the perspective of the mobile recovery officer is. We can see an aircraft coming in, and uh, you've got a problem with his wings being uh, controlled throughout the landing roll and until he's in a full. And once again, we get some pretty good wing control throughout the roll out there. He didn't really run into any rational problems at all throughout that landing. Now, in this next one, it turns out. 
we're going to use full flaps, and he didn't really get the, the tail wheel down as far as he should have. Because of the unique landing characteristics of the U-2, all landings are recorded on videotape, so the commander can personally monitor each student's progress. The videotapes are also used as a training aid for the students themselves. They have the opportunity to watch their own landings, and this way are able to perfect their flying skill. We will cover all of the debriefing before the next briefing so that he uh, understands that he can't be up there with no airspeed and a balloon and the wing control on the runway. In the uh, training situation like I am right now, um, your rides can be anywhere, normally on a, a basic instrument ride or a basic uh, contact uh, landing ride type thing. You'd be in the air probably for about two, maybe three hours. When you go out on a photo mission or something of this nature here, it could be anywhere up to eight hours long. You know, as far as the airplane goes, uh, you're constantly busy in a thing. You're just working all the time. It's uh, an old saying, like I flew fighters at one time in Southeast Asia, come back and you can only be good as your number four man out there is, or your number two man. In this airplane, you can only be as good as you are.